Khalsa, Sri Vai Guruji Ki Fateh. Uh, welcome viewers to another episode of uh, mental health and the challenges uh, that's affecting children today. Uh, in our first episode on this subject, we were joined by uh, Mittal Thanky, CEO and founder of the Spark Academy, who's also a science, maths and English teacher. And we were also fortunate enough to be joined by Sunil Nafri, who is uh, an NLP practitioner, English teacher, as well as an executive life coach. So uh, Mithil and Sunil, uh, thank you both for uh, returning to the show to discuss this uh, very interesting subject. Thank you for having us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we had some interesting feedback from our viewers and parents from the last show and, and they were particularly interested in uh, the tactics that parents can have or whoever's looking after children uh, that have mental health problems. So you mentioned briefly in our first episode on particular tactics. So just from your experience, what do you find is most helpful in um, whether it's a strategy or whether it's a, um, a, a long-term action to help um, children with mental health problems? Yeah, I think it's, it is about having a strategy, having approaches, and also being aware of certain techniques as well. In terms of having a particular strategy, it's so important to be able to have that conversation about mental health. It's okay to talk about our psychological well-being. It's okay not to be okay. It is absolutely fine. There's nothing to worry about. If there is an issue with having with thoughts, feelings, and emotions, and it's 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 affecting their behavior. Uh, it's having uh, an impact on them in terms of their well-being, their schooling, how they are in general. So really, I think the first thing I wanted to mention to all the viewers: it's so important to say it's okay for us to talk about uh, mental health and emotional well-being. This is what the schools are doing anyway. The schools are embedding it in all aspects of their work and the whole ethos of the school. So really it should also be uh, part and parcel of what we're trying to do with our children within the home as well. So to really make it completely acceptable. And also we need to also be very clear that even though we have, we have physical health, which a lot of people identify with in terms of, you know, weight management, um, physical stamina, you know, uh, you know, you know, trying to make sure that we look after what we, you know, what we eat and, and our diet, etc. But we should give equal, maybe even more credence to mental health and also the fact that mental health as an aspect of health actually exists. It is an absolute reality. So we need to make sure that mental health is really up there alongside physical health and we need to keep both in check and we need to do things to help us with both aspects of health so we need to make sure there is equality in all aspects of health particularly between emotional well-being mental health and also physical health as well so with physical health for example as we are aware that if we're running a little bit fast uh, that, our, that our heart uh, beat will then go a bit faster uh, the, the same goes if we're going to be eating too much, it's going to possibly have a, an impact on how we're feeling. We're feeling, we're feeling bloated, uh, we, we might put on weight, etc. So we're aware of the physical consequences of doing things with our body. Also, so are people aware of the impact of what their thoughts are having on them? How it's making them feel? Is it making them feel sad, unhappy, irritated? Is it making them feel very annoyed? And then how those feelings are then translated into possible decisions that could then result in actions and maybe consequences, good, bad, or otherwise. So this is why we need to give equal, even more credence to, um, to mental health, physical health, by making sure through conversations and normalizing it. So whichever way you want to look at this, it has to be normalized within the household as it is in schools and colleges, wherever we have children and young people. So the same should be applying to the home as well. So I would say really in terms of making sure that, that, that we really open up those conversations. I mean, there are specific techniques like you could use in terms of make sure you have circle time. For example, that now and then before or after dinner or certain times within the household that you all congregate and then you talk, everyone talks about how they feel. I feel this, I feel that. I mean, in schools, they, 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 they show them pictures of, do you feel sad? Do you feel happy? Do you feel angry? Tell me if so, why? 
So ha having the visual prompt there might, might really be very helpful. And also it's really important to be able for, for the children to also express what they're grateful for, you know, because we're not just talking about identifying negative mental health issues, but also celebrating positive mental health when they do feel good, when they do feel like celebrating, when some, someone has said something fantastic, we want to celebrate that. So, you know, what's, what's been brilliant about their day, what's been fantastic. And, uh, and again, a lot of the, the, the techniques are around the interaction, around the conversations that actually happens. It's really important that those conversations happen and they're carefully managed and also the, the children feel supported, but also parents feel confident in, able, in, in, in actually having the ability to be able to do that as well. Okay. I mean, I, I agree. Uh... I, sorry, I was just gonna say, Ravi, that I agree with what Sonal was saying about having that open and honest conversation around mental health. Um, however, you know, sometimes that's not the easiest you know, with, with your children, you know, sometimes children find it really hard to express themselves. So that's quite common, especially in younger children as well. Um, and because they're not able to verbalize how they feel. So if your child finds it difficult to express themselves verbally, you can use a really simple technique. Um, you can use toys, any, any objects around you. You can use artwork, um, art materials, for example. And you can ask your child a really simple thing. You know, you can ask them, show me how you're feeling. If they're struggling to verbalize how they're feeling, just say, look, show me how you're feeling. And you'll find that sometimes those children will play out those scenarios using their toys or they might um, produce artwork, which gives you more insight into, into their feelings and emotions. And another thing that I would actually say as well is that it's really important that um, parents also practice and model good habits in, in mental health. Um, we know that children learn from copying what they see around them. So I would say it's really important for parents to take care of their mental health and well-being so that their children know what good habits will look like. So an example, like Sunil mentioned, you know, having that circle time moment, for example, um, having a designated time during the day where you practice um, a well-being technique together is, is really beneficial. So an example would be uh, practicing something known as breath work. Um, I'm a massive advocate of breath work and uh, breath work means it's just breathing techniques. There's loads of benefits um, regarding, regarding breath work, which includes you know boosting of your immune system um, it helps increase your confidence it helps you process your emotions and, and your feelings it can help healing pain and trauma um, so there's so many benefits of being able to um, regulate the way you breathe um, and an example would be a very simple technique known as the 478 breathing technique where you breathe in through your nose for four seconds um, and hold the breath for, for seven seconds and then breathe out, exhale um, out through your mouth for eight seconds. And when you are breathing out, uh, you've got to make this whooshing sound. So that really helps to sort of um, regulate your breathing, calm any nerves and stay in the moment, be in the present. Um, because a lot of the time anxiety and fears are based on something that's happened yesterday or something that's happened in the past. You know, um, anxieties are also based on something that could be happening in the future. So if you're, by, by doing these techniques together as a family, say before you eat breakfast together, for example, is a great way to model that, that, um, that behavior and a great way for your children to, to realize exactly um, the techniques that they can use when they're feeling, um, like they're not coping, for example. Um, and another thing I would actually like to say is that, you know, when you are spending that time together as a family, you know, um, be in the present, be in that moment um, and give your full attention to the children without having phones or anything like that there. Unless obviously you decide to take a picture um, to, to, to capture that moment, that's absolutely fine. But in terms of using social media, et cetera, um, I would say, you know, try and model that good behavior. Um, and in time, your children will learn um, to, to be in the moment and be present. Okay, so to help someone be in the moment and be present, uh, when parents are at home uh, with the children after children have finished school for the day and at the moment school is at home so yeah. 
after uh, <laughs> after a day's learning and, and and teaching, how do you switch off from social media? And um, you know, j- just to make clear to the viewers that no one here is against social media, but we're simply sharing our views on how you can balance your day. So, just in terms of balancing the day, um, how can children and parents balance the day so that they can have that circle time or that time to themselves. Yes, thank you very much, Ravi. It's I mean, yeah, I I, t- I totally support what you're saying in terms of uh, the use of social media and digital um, technology. I mean, I mean, we've we've obviously seen the huge benefits of it throughout this period in keeping keeping connected, keep, keeping in touch, etc. But like I think in 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 all things in life, that there, there just has to be an appropriate balance. Okay. Now, if I can just talk a little bit about um, Howard Gardner's eight multiple intelligences, because with social media, it only taps into a few of them. I mean, the actual intelligence include physical intelligence, uh, linguistic intelligence, logical, spatial, interpersonal, intrapersonal, and also naturalistic and musical intelligence. And we also have to think, well, if we are if we are actually going to be making sure that our child has a very balanced home life, that is not dominated by social media, then certain questions need to be asked as to whether we're actually getting, whether the child is getting the most out of their experience after school. So questions like, for example, is my child uh, getting enough exercise or eating healthily? That would be the physical intelligence. Is my child more quiet than usual or have they lost their interest in reading? So that would go on to linguistic intelligence. Is, you know, has my child lost their interest in doing puzzles or board games? That would be space, that would be logical. And also spatial intelligence. My child used to like doing artwork or they like used to do, you know, things which are very creative. That would be spatial intelligence. Interpersonal. Have they stopped talking to their friends on the phone with where they used to? Um, naturalistic. Have they lost their interest in maybe just going outside for some fresh air? You know, are they all kind of con- consumed in the one in, in the one space, the one physical space? And also, have they stopped listening to their mute to their favorite music or singing? Some of them may be, you know, talented singers and and also musicians. Has that all stopped? So I, th- I think with the with these eight multiple um, intelligences, uh, we can just do a bit of a check on asking those questions of ourselves, uh, talking to the children. And so let the children actually discover, it's so important, rather than us telling the children explicitly, you know, put your phones away, stop playing your PS4, et cetera, et cetera, Mm. is to open up a discussion. And this is so important in terms of having everlasting change and changing of mindsets and attitudes is to have those conversations and then to ask those questions of 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 the children and allow them to voice their opinions and some may say well i do need my social media for this that, that, that's fine but also can you balance it out with doing a bit of exercise or for you to maybe play your, your musical instrument maybe do a little skit you know in the lounge after we finish dinner or something so i think it's so important that it's, it's so important that social media has its role and I think it's important to be able to set boundaries. Okay, now whether those boundaries are just understood as norms and values in the way we run the household or whether you make it more explicit by, you know, writing some kind of guidance, some guidelines for your, for your, for your children, um, whether you have to be able to put something on, on the bedroom wall or something as a visual reminder. So I think it's about changing, if, if necessary, maybe just adopting a certain culture where social media is a part of it, the digital technology is a part of it. I mean, I've been joking with lots of my uh, educational colleagues that we may have to rewrite Maslow's hierarchy of needs, <laughs> the theory of motivation, and we need to put digital technology, uh, Wi-Fi beneath the physiological needs of having food, having shelter and clothing for us to be able to then self-actualize um, you know, at some point in terms of exceeding our own potential so we can't deny the importance but then with anything like this it's about just having those conversations and there's no one set rule for one family or one household it all depends on the the individual child the parents um uh what 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 is going to work as long as there's some kind of a balance at the end 
I, I think it's also really important to understand why your children want to go on social media. And I think this should also resonate with, with parents as well. So although, you know, social media is fantastic because, you know, we, we're, more, we're all more connected now than, than ever before uh, with people across the globe, um, you know, we're all part of networks and we can pick up new skills and, 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 and new learning as well. We, we do know, and I think collectively we can appreciate that there are certain downsides to, to social media. So um, current research um, held by the Center for Mental Health have found that 5% of young people are addicted to social media. Now, when we're talking about addiction, we're talking about the need for that instant gratification and the uh, release of dopamine. So dopamine is basically a chemical in the brain that's associated with pleasure and, and reward. And so that desire for that hit of dopamine, and if that desire is combined with um, the failure to gain instant gratification, and by that I mean, how many likes have I got on my post? You know, how many people um, have commented on my post? Um, you know, that causes people to refresh their social media feeds quite regularly. Um, now, as we can appreciate, this is not just a problem with, with young people, you know, this is a problem amongst us adults as well. And, you know, what's actually worrying is that if that instant gratification is not met, then what happens is that as a result of not getting enough likes, as, in, as a result of not getting enough comments, for example, children and adults can basically internalize beliefs, you know, um, such as, hey, you know what, I've not got those that many likes, I'm not popular, or nobody thought my joke was witty or funny, so that means I'm not funny. Um, and those ideas and those thoughts get, get embedded deep into the unconscious or subconscious mind. Um, and that's when children will start believing that of themselves. Um, and so the, the whole aspect of getting likes and getting posts, um, uh, getting um, people to post on your wall, etc. Um, it gives children, in particular, a sense of, of validation. Um, and if they're not validated by their peers or their friends, then that could lead to all sorts of other issues as well, such as you know, body image issues, low self-esteem, etc. And those things then go on to amplify feelings of loneliness and feelings of anxiety. Um, and one, one phenomenon I would say that, that a lot of people are experiencing um, is FOMO, so this, this whole idea of the fear of, of missing out, and that also adds to, to loneliness, especially at the moment, you know, with the, with, with the pandemic, um, you know, children want to stay connected with, with, with their friends and with their peers. Um, and when they are back at school, you know, you might find that you'll have a conversation where your children will say, hey, I want to join this new social media platform, and you're going to have to start battling um, with your children about either going on it or not going on it. And the reason why they're feeling this way is because they are experiencing FOMO. Um, so, you know, it's, it's getting that balance. It's that whole idea of um, them wanting to stay connected with their friends. They don't want to miss out. They don't want to feel socially disconnected from them either. And we've got to remember that we're all human beings. So we, we love, you know, group interaction. So having that social exclusion from their friends um, can have damaging psychological impacts on the children. So it's about getting a balance. It's about sort of um, sort of having those healthy discussions, as, as Sunil mentioned, about you know um, the right the right timings in which you know you could utilize social media, uh, when we need to switch off, and setting those rules and guidelines and keeping it visual. But I think as a parent, I think it's really important to understand why the kids are behaving the way they are. So it helps you understand um, where they're coming from a little bit. But I do believe that a balance is, is required. And finally, I think that, I, I think Sunil mentioned this point, you know, um, being clear about your feelings, understanding how, how your feeling can, can be measured against, say, for example, a metric. So your phone tells you how much screen time you've had. Um, so if you're able to write a journal, for example, and look at the, the feelings and emotions you've been feeling in that week, and then compare it against, you know, the, the amount of social media time you've had, you know, you'll start building up analytics for yourself and realizing 
what's working for you, what's not, and you'll start to realize, actually, do I need to decrease the amount of screen time that I have? And you can set yourself targets. So you could say, right, next week, I'm gonna try and decrease my screen time by 10 minutes, and then up that time every single week. So again, um, like I mentioned, it's all about balance, um, understanding the whys, and coming up with solutions that work with you and your family. Okay, um, and uh, th this is um, a very interesting and, and important subject. And um, with uh, just over a few minutes left, uh, what I wanted to ask on behalf of the viewers is what counselling services are available, um, whether someone's at a public state funded school or whether they're in a private school, what help can they get from organisations uh, to deal with mental health problems for children? Yes, I mean, if I just mentioned that there needs to be enough red flags which have been identified by maybe the school, by by the family, uh, that this actually is not just lower mood, it's probably bordering on to depression and anxiety. So at that point, either through the GP or through the school, uh, they can be referred to CALMS, which is Child and Adult sorry child and adolescent mental health service and then they will then be dealt with by a calms practitioner who would either offer counseling psychotherapy family therapy depending on the actual issue itself so so normally that so calms is is the actual nhs part of uh, children and adolescent uh, mental health services so that would obviously be uh, uh, available. But also it is obviously the parent's choice that if they wanted to go down a more private route, then really that they, they could then go on the counseling uh, directory and they could then find a private uh, practitioner, uh, a counselor, obviously they would have to be uh, BCAP registered and, and, and that way then they'd be able to get a referral and then they'll be able to then talk to the therapist again, whether it's a counselor, family therapist or a psychotherapist, depending on the actual issues in hand. So they could either go either NHS or uh, private They actually needed to talk out. Then they can either approach their school or they can approach an organization called Young Minds, and they're available on, online. And they also have links with Childline, Relate, uh, organizations called The Mix or uh, Kahoot. They can actually um, help to provide uh, confidential time for the child to talk openly honestly outside of the household um, environment and also in terms of uh, private as well there are also coaches as well they're actually available to help um, uh, the, the child the parents to look at things like uh, developing techniques for, for building resilience building confidence um building uh, uh their their own kind of understanding of particular issues moving themselves forward from from where they are without having going down a kind of a therapeutic counseling route but more of a coaching and training type route to then look at different behaviors and techniques that they could employ as they as they go about their day-to-day -day life with counseling it's more about awareness raising and discovery and resolution but then the coaching route might be more about learning technique and transformation and growth. So those are the main kind of areas there. And I, I, I concur with Sunil really about this. Um, you know, if, if you feel like your child is struggling and if it's taking longer on the NHS, then I, my, my advice would be, you know, don't hesitate to seek, you know, professional, independent professional advice if, if your finances allow and just want to, sort of point out that time is of the essence and you must see that um, you must see it as an investment um, into your child's mental health and well-being and not look at it as, as a cost. So think about it. I mean, you know, you probably send your child for, for tutoring because you want them to, to do better. You want their career outcomes to be better for the future. Um, so if you think of, um, you know, going to a, a private practitioner um, you you should consider it because your child will experience, you know, firsthand transformative life skills that will help them um, deal with any mental health um, issues in the future as well and help them to cope better um, long run. Okay. All right. That's uh, some very useful advice. Um, uh, thank you, Mithil, and, and thank you, Sunil. And um, 
just before we conclude the show, uh, any uh, final thoughts uh, to our audience? I really just, you know, just be as open as you can with anything to do with, you know, a child's emotional well-being and and really to start having those conversations because normally it's the conversations that pave the way that actually pave the uh, the uh, the way for other things to happen and there are external uh, external organizations out there that can help but it's all about having been comfortable to have those conversations mm -hmm first and foremost and the school is there to help the school has to work with certain principles that are also checked with Ofsted as well so a parent could ask their their um, their child's school well can you tell me what you know you know what is the school doing about mental health and emotional well-being for my child uh, now the school can either reel off all the eight principles that they have to follow nationally uh, or they can just go into specific examples that are relevant to the child but yeah just have those conversations and I'd, I'd say you know, model those behaviours, work together and, and learn together, learn great um, mental health practices uh, together. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Sunil and Mithil for taking time out uh, in, in joining us and uh, to the viewers as well, um, please feed back on any thoughts or questions from what we've discussed in today's show on mental health, specifically impacting children uh, in and outside school. Uh, our email address, info at seekchannel.tv. Uh, please also feedback with any further questions that you may have for both Sunil and Mithil. And uh, please um, take care. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you to another segment on our health show. Vaheguru Ji Ka Kalsa, Sri Vaheguru Ji Ke Fatah.